so I didn't set out to be an anti-corruption crusader, right? I was an NPR correspondent. I covered the fall of the Taliban in Afghanistan. And then I decided to stay behind because it just seemed like it was time to do something already. So our first project was to rebuild one of the villages that had been destroyed in the American bombing in 2001. We're talking mud brick villages, but even mud brick villages, you need stone. You need stone for the foundations. In southern Afghanistan, one of the really few things that there's absolutely plenty of is stone. But we couldn't get any stone because the governor, he awarded himself a monopoly on stone so that he could crush it and sell it to the Americans for $100 a tractor load instead of the going market rate, which was eight. That was corruption 101 for me. So, corruption. What do I mean by corruption? It's a really old crime, right? But it's taken on sort of some new threads of late. And I'd like to kind of talk about three traits in particular. First, we're not talking chump change, right? <laughs> the, the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria early last year submitted a detailed memo to the Senate of his country pointing out that there was not a 50, it turns out that there was an excuse for some of it, but there was only a $20 billion shortfall in the amount of money that the national oil company was remitting, meaning it had sold oil, but it was remitting $20 billion too little money over a mere 19-month period. So that's basically a billion dollars a month that was being stolen from the Nigerian people by the elites of Nigeria. I sat down with an FBI agent who, who works these, they're called kleptocracy cases. She said, man, I've got $5 billion cases underway all at the same time. It's unheard of. I mean, imagine being an FBI agent in the Albuquerque field station. You don't work too many billion dollar cases. And the problem with this is that these people are not exactly hiding it. They're kind of <laughs> flaunting it, right? And the real tragedy for ordinary people, it's the contrast that really hurts. That's point one, a lot of money. Point two, it's not actually just a kind of rot that we're talking about. It's not a cancer that's kind of eating away at the bodies of governments. We're not talking about governments that are failing. We're actually talking about criminal organizations that are succeeding. These are businesses, they're successful businesses, they're sophisticated, and they are structured. What I mean in particular by they're structured is that they're vertically integrated. And that means, you know, you get shaken down by a cop on the street, and believe me, in Afghanistan, it happens every day. In Afghanistan, in Nigeria, where I've spent time, in Uzbekistan, in all of the Arab Spring countries. I mean, it's not weekly, it's daily you get shaken down. But that cop, he's not just putting the money in his pocket. It's going up the line. He's paying a portion to his superior, his superior pays a portion of everything he gets, and it goes up the line. So this is vertically integrated. In return for the money that's going upwards, protection goes downwards. The second point about this structure is that it is horizontally in integrated. And what that means is that government officials, private sector, private industry, outright criminals, and in some cases terrorists, are all wired into the same integrated network. Now, here we go. The third point about this has to do with personal dignity. You think when a cop shakes you down in the street to ask you for money, he's asking? You think he's saying, please? Hardly. It's incredibly humiliating. He's flaunting that protection that he's received from the government in return for the money. He's got impunity, and he's rubbing your face in it. And here's how we get to extremism. If a young man in Afghanistan 
gets hit in the face by a cop when he won't cough up the petty bribe, or if a Nigerian's sister is raped by a judge for the privilege of having her case heard, what do you suppose those two young men want to do? They want to kill the guy. <laughs> well, in southern Afghanistan and northern Nigeria, Boko Haram or the Taliban and Boko Haram are standing right beside them saying, yeah, kill the guy. Here's a gun. And what they're saying, the argument that they're making is that the reason that judge or that cop is so rotten, the reason he's so corrupt, is because our government isn't organized around God's law. He doesn't obey God's law. If only he obeyed God's law, if only our government were structured according to God's law, there's no way he could treat you so badly. What's interesting about this argument is it's not just Islam and it's not just today. As I started doing research into this, I discovered that one of the biggest revolutions in Western history was really driven by a lot of the same principles. It's called the Protestant Reformation. I started reading Martin Luther, not King, the guy that King was named after. He was a priest in the 16th century, and he hammered these 95 theses up on the wall of a church, and they were challenging fundamental elements of um, Catholic dogma. You read the thing, it's all about corruption. It's about simony, it's about indulgences. Indulgences, that's basically paying to get somebody out of purgatory. So you're essentially buying and selling salvation. They were buying and selling legal cases, they, legal decisions, they were buying and selling plots in a cemetery. One of the biggest revolutions in Western history was all about corruption. And oh, by the way, it wasn't a particularly nonviolent movement. It was really bloody. They started attacking buildings. They started attacking really symbolic buildings, like churches. Wow. It looks a little bit familiar, doesn't it? I'm not trying to excuse these people. That's not the point of this conversation. What I'm trying to say is that if we don't understand what drives people to extremes, then we're going to have a really hard time trying to reduce extremism in our world. And if you look at, let's take ISIS, let's take the Taliban, let's take Boko Haram, let's take the anti-corruption revolutions that we've seen since like 2010, Kyrgyzstan, the whole Arab Spring, Ukraine, we've all been talking about Ukraine. Some of these have then spun out of control into some of the most severe security crises that we're dealing with today. Add to that the protests. Right now, we've got Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Chile, Brazil, Moldova, Malaysia, Iraq, Lebanon. We've got seven or eight anti-corruption mass protests going on today. Add to that um, environmental degradation. And I think it's fair to say that corruption is either helping to cause or is exacerbating just about every severe security crisis we're looking at today. Don't change the channel next time you hear the word corruption. It's not about boring stuff like right and wrong and doing the right thing or business ethics. It's about what really concerns us the most at the moment as Americans often, security. So what does that mean to us? What should we be doing about it? First thing I would say is just like a lot of us have stopped buying sneakers or clothing that's built in sweatshops where people you know, are working 12 hours a day for no pay, there are banks, there are legal firms, there are real estate firms, there are registered agents who make their money off of providing services to these kleptocrats. I think it's time that we figured out a way to make them change their business model. And secondly, I think we better be really careful that our own country doesn't start to resemble the ones I've been talking about any more than it already does. Thank you.